Wassalamu alaikum. Welcome, dear fellow learners. Islamic caliphates, are they really prophesied in the Bible? With the recent death of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, is the hope of a caliphate also dead? Will Turkey, Iran, or some other power step up? I will show you that both past caliphates and a soon-coming final caliphate are prophesied in the Bible. I was initially inspired to study this topic in 2013 when I read a book called Islam and Christianity by Tim Rosenberg. He is a Christian Bible scholar, and since then I've been involved with this group of scholars studying and learning new things about the amazingly specific prophecies that I will show you. I've also been learning about some of the Islamic prophecies on this topic. First, I want you to know who I am. I am a disciple of Isa. I call him by his Hebrew name, Yeshua, and I seek to live charitably, pray, and do only what is permitted. I am one of the faithful among the people of the book. Surah Ali Imran, Ayah 52, says that Isa asked his disciples, Who will be my helpers in the cause of Allah? My pledge to you, listener, is that I will also be Isa's helpers in the cause of God. I want to share these prophecies with you because I believe they give us hope. Hope that the wars will end and there will be peace among the sons of Abraham. Hope that the judgment day will happen. Isa al-Masi, Yeshua the Messiah, will soon return. And the faithful true believers, a remnant of Islam and Christianity, will you unite. They will rendezvous, they will come together and inherit paradise. <clears throat> So if you have a Bible, you may open it to the book of Daniel or try BibleGateway.com for a translation in your own language. Daniel is a book of the Tanakh, a part of the larger body of Jewish literature, which includes the Torah and Zabor or the Psalms. It is also considered holy by Christians as part of their Old Testament. Let us pray. Abba, God in heaven, we come before you asking for a spirit of understanding, a humble spirit, that we may understand your word which you have given. In the name of God, the most merciful, the most gracious, I read uh, Daniel chapter 11, verses 29 through 30. At the appointed time he shall return and go towards the south, but it shall not be like the former or the latter. For ships from Cyprus shall come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved and return in rage against the Holy Covenant and do damage. How did Daniel know to make this prophecy? 2,500 years ago, the angel Gabriel revealed this prophecy to Daniel at God's command. This was right after the Persians, under Cyrus the Great, conquered the city of Babylon uh, where Daniel was living as an exile. Uh, he was Jewish. Uh, he had been uh, captured by Nebuchadnezzar and taken to live in Babylon um, a few years before the temple in uh, Jerusalem was destroyed, the temple that Solomon had built. He had become one of their leading wise men. We know that these wise men were highly educated in many sciences, especially astronomy. It would be very easy for Daniel to describe what he was seeing in vision, things, places, and also including knowing to within maybe a couple days when an event occurred based on the position of the sun and the moon and the stars that he observed. Daniel captured these observations for us in four very specific Hebrew words. These four words are colored here. They make up four pillars supporting our interpretation of this prophecy. If any one of them does not fit our interpretation, we must look for an alternate fulfillment in some other historic event. The first observation Daniel made was based on his familiarity with the Hebrew festivals. This word moed, which is often translated in English as appointed times, is specifically used for the Hebrew religious festivals. You can watch more on this on my teaching on the moed for further details. But in short, God commanded Israel to keep seven festivals throughout the year in the spring and in the fall. The timing of these festivals was based on the sighting of the moon. Negeb means south, but it is also used for desert. Uh, this is because the Negev, or south of uh, the country of Israel, 
uh, is a desert. So it's a, it's a euphemism. Tazim is a specific kind of ship, and Katim is a specific place. When we look for fulfillment of this prophecy, then, it must contain all of these specific elements, or our interpretation is wrong, and it falls apart. So first, let us look at Tazim. My friend Randy Yonker and his son Michael, they are scholars of Middle East archaeology and history. They are now study, studying this Hebrew word. It's actually a borrowed word from Egyptian and refers to a specific kind of ship. This ship dominated the Mediterranean for 2,000 years until cannons became widely available. In the commemorative painting that you see here, um, you can see examples of these ships. Uh, these are at the Battle of Lepanto, which is a very famous naval battle that was fought in 1571 of the Common Era. Note that these ships are large war galleys with a shooting deck. They are powered by a single sail and oarsmen. So this painting is of the specific kind of ship described by this specific Hebrew word. I also want you to note, before we move on, the combatants, each kind of in their distinctive clothing. Here we have a Catholic fleet with uh, banners uh, flying the cro of the cross, and they are engaging with an Ottoman fleet of the Caliphate uh, flying banners with the crescent. In addition to Tazim, there are specific places mentioned in the prophecy. Randy Yonker gave a great presentation a year ago, you can find it on YouTube, showing how Katim is the Hebrew word for Cyprus. We have Tizim ships from Cyprus, but where are they going? First mentioned in this prophecy is a power going towards the south. The Tizim ships are coming against this power. This means that these ships are going towards the north. Where did these two powers meet? Well, in the case of the Battle of Lepanto, the fleet of the Ottoman Caliphate sailed from Katim or Cyprus going towards the north. The opposing force was comprised of Spanish and Italian uh, teasing ships going towards the south. These fleets combined at Messina and were blessed by the Catholic Pope before sailing on to Lepanto. <clears throat> this power from the south, the Ottoman Caliphate, that engages in battle with power from the north the Catholic Papacy, they engage in the Battle of Lepanto in 1571. So we have three specific Hebrew words that are fulfilled in this Battle of Lepanto. Could this famous naval battle really be a candidate for fulfilling Daniel's prophecy? We have three of the four. So when did it occur? Did it fulfill the fourth word, Moed? For this battle to be a fulfillment of this prophecy, it must have also occurred at a specific time. The specific time is divine, defined by the Hebrew word for a Hebrew religious festival, Moed. So let's look at the timeline of events surrounding the Battle of Lepanto and see if it fits. Famagusta was a Venetian colony on Cyprus. As the drawing above shows, the Ottomans laid siege and conquered it. They left Famagusta on the island of Cyprus to find a winter harbor on August 5th. The Venetians, angry with losing their colony, they join with Spain, and under the banner of the newly formed Holy League, which is blessed by the Catholic Pope, leave Messina on September 6th to hunt down the Ottomans. October 5th, the Moed of Sukkot, the Hebrew Fall Festival begins. It is a week-long festival, we know when this starts because it is easy to look up the phases of the moon in history. It's simple math. It is a very uh, joyous festival commanded by God to be kept for a week. However, October 7th, 1571, during this joyous festival, the bloody Battle of Lepanto is fought. So it appears that this battle fulfills the prophecy. Let us review. At the appointed time... <clears throat> He shall return and go towards the south. So we have the Catholic fleet, the papacy, going towards the south. There's our first pillar. Secondly, we have Tazim ships, very specific kind of ship, uh, war galleys of the Ottoman fleet, leaving Cyprus after their conquest of Famagusta. And 
going towards the north. And finally, we have the Battle of Lepanto fought during the Moed, during the appointed time, the Festival of Sukkot in October of 1571. My friends, there is no other event in history that I know of. Maybe you do. Please send it to me if you do. Um, but there is no other event in history that matches these four specific requirements of the prophecy so precisely. But what is the end of the matter? The rest of the verse says, he, meaning the Pope, shall be grieved. Well, the Battle of Lepanto was actually won by the Catholics, by the papacy. However, they lost the war and they lost control of the Eastern Mediterranean. This explains why he would be grieved. He lost the war. And what does he do? He returns in rage against the Holy Covenant. You see, in the end, the papacy loses the war and he turns against the faithful people of the book. He turns home and there is the Inquisition and the following year, the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, where hundreds of faithful people of the book were killed, slaughtered. Both faithful people of the book, uh, Jews and Muslims, were persecuted by the papacy during this time. You see, something I want to point out to you is that Islam is the friend of the faithful people of the book. Each time the faithful people of the book come back to God, each time they reform and repent, the Catholic papacy persecutes them. But God raises up Islamic armies to attack the papacy. This distracts the papacy and it spares many of the faithful people of the book from persecution. Okay, so we have a prophecy given by Gabriel to the prophet Daniel. It was fulfilled 2,000 years later. So first let me point out that if the Bible was changed, if it was altered in any way, we would not be able to tie this prophecy with actual events, specific events in history, and see the fulfillment of the prophecy. Truly this is a sign for those who believe. You see, the whole point of prophecy is to build our faith in God. But this is history. What can it tell us about the future? Why are these verses so important? Well, what else do we see in these verses? But it shall not be like the former or the latter. What is the former and the latter? Well, because this is these verses describe a war, then the former and the latter must be a war between the same opponents between false Christianity and Islam. Can you think of a war before the Ottoman Caliphate, a former war, that was established um, or, or that was fought between the Catholic papacy and Islam before the Ottoman Caliphate was established? I think you can. But before we get there, I'm going to talk about the former and the latter. Remember how in this verse it talks about the power going towards the south and what is in the north going towards the south? Well, we've already said it was the Catholic papacy. Do you see how in this map of world religions, Christianity shown in purple is in the north? The majority of Christianity, and this is a very important distinction, with the exception of the faithful people of the book, so apostate Christianity, is led by the Catholic Pope from Rome. What do we see in the south? colored in green, we have the vast deserts of North Africa, Arabia, and Persia. And here we find the adherents of Islam with their religious center in Mecca. I want you to keep this in mind as we continue reading. The Catholic Pope is the ruler of the North. The Caliphate is led by the King of the South. So this is still part of the same prophecy, but we're going to back up a few verses to verse 25. Daniel 11 verse 25. He shall stir up his power and his courage, the he being referred to being the king of the north, because he is going against the king of the south with a great army. And the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army, but he shall not stand. 
for they shall devise plans against him. Yes, those who eat of the portion of his delicacy shall destroy him, his army shall be swept away, and many shall fall down slain. Both these kings' hearts shall be bent on evil, and they shall speak lies at the same table, but it shall not prosper, for the end will still be at the appointed time. While returning to his land with great riches, his heart shall be moved against the holy covenant, and he shall return and do damage in his own land. So again we see the papacy initiating the Crusades. They take Jerusalem and they win the Battle of Ascalon, which was fought against the, the very large army of the Fatimid Caliphate. Um, <clears throat> And just as this verse says, many fall down slain. The major atrocities and horrendous bloodshed during the Crusades. Just like the Battle of Lepanto, the Catholic papacy, the king of the north, wins the battle, but ultimately loses the war. Eventually the Muslims retake Jerusalem, once again uh, conquering it, and the, the Crusaders, they all go home. And what happens when the papacy loses the war? His heart will be stirred up against the Holy Covenant. So once again, he is persecuting true believers. Okay, again, history. But what about the latter? The, the latter. Okay, so we're going to go down to Daniel 11, verse 40, where it says, at the time of the end. Okay, has the judgment day occurred? No. So at the time of the end, very close to judgment day. This has not occurred yet. This is the future. This is what we want to know about. At the time of the end, the king of the south, Islam, shall attack him. The adversary again is who? The king of the north, apostate Christianity. The king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, and with chariots, horsemen, and with many ships. And he shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. He shall also enter the glorious land. Now... In the mind of Daniel, the glorious land would be the land of his birth, his homeland from which he had been taken captive and exiled. Uh, this would be Israel. Um, so keep that in mind, the glorious land. <clears throat> so we have the papacy invading many Islamic and even the country of Israel. <clears throat> Continuing reading. He shall also enter the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape from his hand, Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. We'll come back to that. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt. Also the Libyans and Ethiopians shall follow at his heels. But news from the east and from the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. I want you to know it says many, not all. And he shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and no one will help him. Okay, so what is this glorious holy mountain? Daniel again was a Jew. The glorious holy mountain would have been the site of Solomon's temple that was destroyed um, just after Daniel was taken captive. Today, this is where Al-Aqsa and the Haram al-Sharif stand. There's a very uh, controversial place fought over by um, Muslims, Christians, and Jews. And what this verse is telling us is that the king of the north, the papacy, sets up the tents of his palace, his headquarters, there between the sea, the Mediterranean, and the temple, the Al-Aqsa. Why does he invade Israel? You know, we, we don't really know why. You know, this is prophecy, it is future, we can only speculate. Um, but I imagine that it is probably because he's looking for a new headquarters, because the Vatican in Rome is destroyed by the King of the South. After all, it says, at the time of the end, he, the King of the South, and you remember who that is, attacks him. Uh, as my new uh, Turkish friend recently pointed out to me, it is prophesied in the Hadith that Islam in the future, very soon, will destroy Rome. Maybe that is why the papacy is looking for a new headquarters and chooses Jerusalem. 
But what I want you to get from this prophecy is that today there is no king of the south. The prophecy does not say kings, plural. It is singular, the king of the south. You see, only after a new caliphate is established can this future prophecy be fulfilled. This is why I can confidently say that the Bible predicts another caliphate. <clears throat> so, to review then, the future caliphate attacks the, the papacy. Probably just as the Hadith predict, Rome is destroyed. The papacy retaliates, it takes over many countries, including Egypt. Um, <clears throat> so it's, it's attacking the countries that attacked it. It is going for revenge. Uh, it sets up its headquarters near Jerusalem. But we know that Jordan is saved. And why do I say Jordan? It is because it says Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. Those three, as shown in the map above, comprise the modern country of Jordan. These represent and are a people of a remnant of true believers within Islam. So you have the, the radicals of Islam that the papacy conquers after they attack the papacy. And then you have this remnant that is destroyed. But there is a third group, Libya and Ethiopia, follow at his heels, as the verse says. This means they join with the papacy. These are the traitors of Islam who convert to false Christianity. The papacy then, once again, attacks faithful people of the book. But as I pointed out, it goes off to destroy and annihilate many, not all. You see, there's a remnant of faithful people of the book as well as a remnant among Islam who rendezvous. They meet up, they join forces, and they're the ultimate winners at the end of the day. You see, the papacy is ultimately destroyed. False Islam, the radicals, are destroyed as well. So the end of the story, then, is that um, <clears throat> you have multiple caliphates, multiple wars between uh, the P Catholic papacy and Islam, and ultimately, they both destroy each other with a remnant of true believers being saved. So in conclusion, caliphates are in the Bible, and they are the Arab caliphates during the Crusades, the Turkish Ottoman caliphate that fought the Battle of Lepanto, and we saw that so specifically and so precisely fulfilled in those four very specific Hebrew words. Um, <clears throat> but ultimately, in the future, um, a new caliphate arises, and the final war is fought with the Catholic papacy. Um, after this, we know that the arch-deceiver um, comes. He's pretending to be al-Masih, the Messiah, this deceiver is the Dajjal in Islam, the Antichrist in Christianity. Um, but the end of the story is that um, <clears throat> Isa al-Masi, Yeshua the Messiah, returns and the eternal kingdom of God is set up. So this is our common hope in which we can find unity, the remnant of true believers. The faithful among the people of book and the true believers among Islam, we can unite on this common point that Isa al-Masi, Yeshua the Messiah, is coming back very, very soon and that God is faithful to judge in his mercy and to bring us into paradise. This is our common hope in which we can find unity. And here is what I say. Let the radicals, the fundamentalists, the outlaws of Islam, and the unfaithful papacy, let them destroy each other. Us brothers of peace, we will not fight in their unholy wars. A faithful remnant of both Islam and Christianity will escape their hands. We will rendezvous, we will come together, we will be ready for the judgment day, the return of Isa al-Masih, Yeshua the Messiah. He is the Prince of Peace, and may his peace be with you. Salam.